All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are watching this. Um, my name is Wisdom Ambuzu, and I am one of the co-founders of Empower Community High School. And to the right of me digitally is... Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm, um, an, I'm Wisdom's co-founder at Empower. Great. Um, and we just have 15 minutes, so we'll jump right in. And uh, we're going to share some slides um, from our learning labs that uh, happen on Fridays with the full tribe. And uh, the top topic for today really is what, what works, what does not work when it comes to digital schooling? And what does that mean for the future of education? Um, so first, I'm just going to facilitate and ask uh, Olivia some questions. Um, and we'll walk through a few examples and then we'll end with just a final discussion on uh, how we're currently approaching this moment. Okay. So first, uh, Jones, if you don't mind, before we dive into any of these materials, um, in this current moment, uh, what kinds of teachers are you seeing are actually successful right now and what teachers are not and why? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, what we're seeing from the first month is teachers who lean into their creativity are the most successful. Ones who are thinking about how to approach online school in like they've, they've, uh, well, it kind of answers both of your questions at once. Anyone who's trying to still deliver what we used to think of as traditional school, students coming in, lecturing to them, um, you know, students having some kind of worksheet or something that they need to submit. We're seeing that that's not successful um, and that teachers who are, have the courage to really redesign and rethink how they approach instruction to fit within a digital world, um, that they've been the most successful. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and makes even more sense why you chose this title. Can you tell us uh, who gives a damn? <laughs> Starting off hot. Uh, why that title? What was, you know, what did you see that actually inspired the need to focus on this? And then we'll start diving into the specifics. Yeah. Um, so the way that we think about professional development at Empower is we run learning labs. And each learning lab cycle is focused on a specific question that, or problem of practice that our whole staff comes together to decide what's the most relevant, what's the problem of practice that's impacting everyone right now that we want to focus on first. Um, and then we look at all the different strategies that teachers in the building are using and we look to find like any kind of text or video of best practices around this specific problem of practice um, online and we offer those as well. And then we all kind of like test new strategies within this area, either from other colleagues at our school or from those uh, other resources. And so we started with this one, who gives a damn? How do you get students to give a damn about what you're doing in class? And I think the key to this is that, you know, sometimes as teachers, we forget that we've spent a lot of time thinking about how to roll content out to students and how to, and what makes that content meaningful and we forget to share that inside information with our students and to do it in a way that actually gets them really energized about the topic. We, um, we started our year with a week of soft opening. It was just a welcome week and students were very engaged in those sessions. They were all like very dialogue based and we designed those sessions without thinking about any academic content, we just thought about what would be the most meaningful experience for students. And so engagement was very high that week. And then we started school the week after and teachers went um, really like immediately into content and they noticed they weren't having that same level of engagement that they had with the same students during welcome week once content had started. And so we kind of stepped back to think about what are the ways in which we can creatively bring students into our thinking and help them to see how the content that they're um, 
that they're learning across all their classes is relevant to what's happening in their lives right now and kind of helping them see the relevance and find entry points into the content that are meaningful for them. Lovely, thank you. Um, all right, let's jump in. If you don't mind, just walk us through a few, uh, I assume what you're having these, why am I pretend acting like I didn't see this? Right. Uh, what you're you have in these lines. slides, <laughs> yes, I was right there. What you have in these slides, uh, you know, outline some bright spots. Do you mind just walking us through a few? Yes. Um, yeah, so you can see we started by just asking this question to the staff and to see kind of who are our experts already on our team? Who's doing this really well and has some tried and true strategies that are they're finding to be effective even in this digital setting? Um, and then really like giving each one of those staff members a chance to share that wisdom with the rest of the team. Um, so in an ideal world, we have them here to tell you a little bit about them, but I'm gonna speak for them today since Wisdom and I have heard um, them share this insight. So the first one comes from an, our ninth grade English teacher, um, whose name is Ariana, and she it has tried a bunch of different online platforms this year to raise engagement and kind of tries to keep the keep the platform that she's using on like changing enough that students are interested and want to engage and it doesn't feel like, well, this is the same old thing. I'm logging into Zoom and then I'm gonna go to Google Docs and then I'm gonna like, you just kind of get into that routine and it gets a little bit boring. Um, so here's how she's approaching strategic use of technology. Um, she started to use this free platform called Flipgrid and Flipgrid allows students to record video responses and they can see each other's comment on each other's video responses. Um, and so that way, if you're trying to assess reading or um, you're looking for a way to just meaningfully find out what a student is thinking, you don't have to use writing every single time. Like a short constructed response doesn't need to be your only tool. You can also use Flipgrid. Um, and so she had students answering this essential question, under what circumstances is it justified to draw a border? And they had to submit a Flipgrid video. And then she actually followed up. So immediately after um, receiving submissions, she would watch the submission and then provide follow-up questions that are specific to each student to really get them to dig deeper um, and take their work to the next level. And this is another way that she's being strategic with technology. Our students now are checking email very often because it's the main way that we communicate announcements and all communication. And so um, she's actually using that to send personalized feedback and one-on-one -on -one emails to students that really give them the kind of qualitative feedback that they need to take their thinking and their work to the next level. Um, this is a small one, but she also personalized her homepage on Canvas to really kind of bring students in and make them feel like excited and that they don't know what to expect because it will not be their average English class. Okay, so um, this is a, another example of how people are strategically using technology. Um, we've pushed teachers to include time in breakout rooms on a daily basis so that it's not like all students in the main room just listening to the teacher talk. Um, and so our teachers have found like or designed small group activities within each lesson that can happen in the breakout rooms that are heavily discussion based. So you can see in this top left corner, this was a lesson in, um, in 10th grade English and they were talking about the difference between dominant narratives and counter narratives. They defined both of those concepts in the main room with all of the students and then he actually put the students into breakout rooms and had them answering what are the counter narratives for each one of the dominant or for these topics. So um, what are the dominant narratives about immigration? And then also what are the counter narratives? Same with police, same with protesting. And then after they were in those small group or breakout rooms in the small group, they came back to the whole or to the main room and students um, were more likely to actually share their responses because they got to test it and talk with their peers in a small group setting before then in the main group, they were asked to share their thinking on these topics. Um, 
The second one is um, from physics, which is in ninth grade. And similarly to the example that we just went through for 10th grade English, he had some whole group instruction where he introduced the concept of bias and what makes something biased and what makes it unbiased. Um, and how do we measure that? And then he actually had students move into breakout rooms with specific case study examples, and they had to analyze where were they seeing bias show up in that case study? Was it truly unbiased or where was um, bias, yeah, where was bias showing up? Um, and he's also using a really cool tool, this same physics teacher, um, with breakout rooms where he has students actually self-assess and they say, okay, I, um, given this topic that we're talking about in physics of displacement. If you had to assess how deeply you understand that concept, like are you a one, are you still beginning and you need more help understanding how to apply it in new contexts, or um, like there's some gaps in your understanding, a two meaning you are, um, you feel fairly confident about it, but um, like you can define it, but maybe you can't apply it in other contexts. And then a three means, um, like you truly understand it through and through and can apply it in other contexts and are actually ready for students to teach, like they would, they feel ready to actually teach other students. That's how much of an expert they are on that topic. And then he'll move them into breakout rooms based on those levels. And he stays with the level one students in a small room or in that breakout room to teach them and help them fill those gaps in their understanding. And then um, twos, they work together and, um, threes actually uh, end up teaching their peers. So um, some of the ones will end up in the room with the threes to actually learn from their peers. And that way he's able to kind of strategically use the advantages that Zoom gives for differentiation. To close out, we're just going to zoom out. Um, and curious, based on everything you're seeing right now, um, what are the practices that you hope will actually carry forward um, once, I don't even like saying post-COVID anymore, uh, but whether we are in-person, remote, or hybrid in the future, um, what are some of the practices you're seeing teachers develop now that you think will actually be really beneficial in the future? The first one that comes to my mind is um, instructions. So instructions for a task, instructions for, um, it, and even instruction at large. I think we, because when we're in a classroom and we can see people's body language and, um, you know, when we can see a student look confused, we can go over and repeat the instructions and try giving them in a different way. And I think ultimately what that, um, that means we don't feel the pressure for our instructions to be extremely solid and explicit and tight the first time that we give them. Um, Cause we start to bank on being able to follow up and read like even nonverbal cues to know which students we need to follow up with. And we don't have that luxury anymore. So I think one thing teachers are getting extremely good at is how do you even both in writing and verbally provide instructions where there's um, less room for misunderstanding. So that would be a big one. Um, the second one is, I guess another one would be that creativity that I named at the beginning. I think um, because we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's a new normal and everything has shifted, people feel more comfortable taking risks and trying creative strategies and, um, just creative ways to present content and build curriculum. And I think that's really important whether we're in the classroom or our classroom is on Zoom. So I would also hope that teachers hold on to that, like the courage to try something differently. And then, okay, the last one, I promise this is it. The third would be right now we, we have to be collecting feedback from students constantly to find out what's working and what isn't. It's almost like everything that was true about education has changed and we can't just rely on, well, I know this is a best, best practice because 
research says it is because I've used it in my classroom in the past because right like all those reasons why we just then will default to this is a this is a best practice that I can rely on and um, neglect to really check in with the learners who are actually in our room at that moment to make sure that it's a best practice for them and I think right now um, all teachers are getting in it's becoming habit to just check and collect feedback from learners to figure out what's working and what isn't and use that information to actually make our instruction stronger. Uh, so that would be the third, I think. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, we'll just go ahead and stop there. Not even sure if we are under or over 15 minutes, but this is remote, so you're not locked in a room with us. Um, but. Thank you, Jones, for sharing your wisdom. Thank you all for listening. Um, and good luck wherever you are. Uh, sending nothing but positivity and light. Be well. Thank you. Bye.